It's not the things that happened in the third grade. It's the things that happened a couple of hours ago that are difficult for people with dementia to remember. There is evidence that not just how much you eat and what you eat, but when you eat it is important. Today's guest is Dr. Mitchell Kleonsky, a clinical neuropsychologist with over 40 years of experience who helps aging adults prevent dementia, Alzheimer's, and keep a healthy brain into old age. If you look at MRI scans of people who don't drink at all, their brains are probably going to be a little larger than the people who do drink. So marijuana these days is very potent stuff. We see people in their 70s who said, I don't have to go to work now, let me get high. It'll help me to sleep, and it'll get rid of some arthritis pain. And what we find out is that it's actually impacting their cognition. Hey there, my friends, welcome back. This is Dr. Anthony Balduzzi, and I wanna welcome you to another amazing episode here on the Fit Father and Fit Mother Project podcast. Buckle up for a great and powerful episode because today I am joined by guest expert, Dr. Mitchell Kleonsky, PhD, who is the author along with his wife of the new book, Dementia Prevention, Using Your Head to Save Your Brain. And I wanted to have Mitchell on the show today because when I look around, I see these massively increasing rates of cognitive decline, dementia. I mean, many of you listening who have aging parents who are still alive, you probably see that what happens at the end of life when our brain is not healthy is it gets into a, a real mess. And, and I think we have an epidemic of stuff going on right now that's multifactorial. So Mitchell's going to be on here to explain all of this for us. He is a board certified neuropsychologist who specializes in evaluating and treating patients with all forms of cognitive impairment, including dementia, ADHD, and TBI. Um, and he works alongside his wife, uh, Emily Kleonsky, who's a medical doctor and does all of this stuff too. And combined, they have 70 years of professional and clinical experience experience helping people. And they run the website braindoc.com and their new book is Dementia Prevention, which you can find anywhere that you uh, would read and find books. So uh, Dr. Mitchell, welcome to the show, my friend. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And the simple promise of this conversation is like, I want people to walk away from this with a greater understanding of what dementia is and what they can do for themselves to prevent it, as well as what to look at with their family members who may be going through. So I just want to kick off. We hear this word a lot, dementia. Like, what is it and how is it different from normal cognitive aging? Great question and often misunderstood. So dementia is a progressive decline in our abilities to think and consequently to function. So it involves problems with language and communication, problems with short-term memory. Uh, interestingly enough, the long-term memory is often very intact. Hmm. It's not the things that happened in the third grade, it's the things that happened a couple hours ago that are difficult for people with dementia to remember. It also involves the ability to solve problems, to think through what to do in situations and how to adapt, as well as how to plan and organize. Really, when you think about it, dementia sooner or later, if you have it and it gets worse, will affect every area of your life and eventually will be a leading cause for your death. So it's a very important but often misunderstood or underappreciated kind of condition. I want to ask, when I think about an aging body, I think the stuff we can see on the outside, we can, we all know what like aging hair looks like, aging skin, you know, muscles might atrophy, but like what happens in a brain that what it ages is like structure actually atrophying? Like, is it getting harder? Like, what well, are there changes happening structurally in the brain that, that go along with cognitive aging? Yes. In most cases there are. At a gross level, we see that there's a shrinkage in the brain volume. So okay. our brains get smaller and consequently the spaces, the ridges, the sulci and the gyri, the ridges and the valleys that are on the surface of our brain get farther apart and we can see how the brain is getting smaller. On MRI scans, particularly, we can also see changes in the connectivity of areas below the surface. Typically, this is call, talked about as white matter changes. Uh, the parts of our brain, the long nerves that are myelinated, that have a coating on them, sort of like the coating on a wire that allows for faster transmission of information electrically 
also happens with a myelin sheath, a protein kind of, actually even a fatty kind of uh, covering to our nerves. And when that begins to break down, often due to vascular factors as much as anything, blood mm -hmm. vessels, circulation, then the speed of transmission decreases, the connectivity gets worse, it makes it harder to think. Mm -hmm. In certain kinds of dementia, particularly Alzheimer's type dementia, there are particular findings on the inner areas, really, both inside and between brain cells, where there's a buildup of a particular kind of protein called beta amyloid. We talk about beta amyloid plaques, particularly. And there's also a breakdown of the structure of the nerve cells, which are called neurofibrillary tangles. Mm -hmm. So those are the two common things that people see when they're looking specifically at that one type of dementia, the Alzheimer's type. Mm -hmm. But there are many other types of dementia, and Alzheimer's may not even be by itself the most significant type, but it's certainly gotten the most attention and the most publicity. So for a lot of people, you know, the question they ask is, well, is this Alzheimer's or is this dementia? When I tell them, well, I believe it's a different form of dementia, they sigh and say, oh, thank goodness. And I say, no, 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 it's not really better. It's just different. So we need to understand what the types are, but also how to treat them, how to slow this down, and even more importantly, and that's the purpose of our book, how to prevent dementia. Mm -hmm. That's the key. For sure. And I, I couldn't think of something more devastating uh, very few things. I mean, obviously cancer is tough, diabetes is tough, heart disease, but like literally seeing your loved ones change in their personality and their executive functioning, let alone to yourself to feel that slow slipping away. I mean, this, this brain is this organ that we completely overlook, although it's at the background of all of our sense functions. What, what can we expect of like the a great picture of what life could be like if we do take great care of our brains, if we're doing the things that we're going to share on the prevention side, like, can we be 95 years old, super sharp? Like, is that, is that a possibility? Like what's possible if we could really get optimal in terms of our lifestyle and we don't have any like really bad genetic factors for this stuff? Yes, it is possible. In fact, one out of two cases of dementia are preventable. That's an amazing statistic, but it's based on real science. There's two large scale studies that were done. The first was done through a review of the literature by a commission in the United Kingdom published in Lancet magazine back in 2017. The Lancet commission involved about 25 eminent uh, scientists who looked at all of the literature. They came up with 11 or 12 modifiable factors that could reduce the risk of dementia by about 40%. Three years later, they added another factor, hearing loss. Most people don't even appreciate that that's related to thinking, mm -hmm. but they added that to it and then recalculated about 42 to 43% of dementias are preventable. A couple years after that in the United States, a large scale study using data from the US Health and Retirement Survey applied those same factors and came up with a statistic of 60%. Now in our book, we actually add several factors to that, which I believe increases it even more. But if we just stick to those two and say, well, there's 40% on one side, 60% on the other, I feel pretty comfortable in saying one out of two cases can be prevented. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to prevent it? Does it mean that we understand the damaging mechanism? So let's just say we have a sense now that like dysregulated blood sugar or heart disease and vascular issues are going to damage the brain that if we understood that and we were healthy in our 20s and 30s that we could offset that trajectory of damage or it means preventable in the sense that okay we might not be healthy at 55 but if we start acting better now and cleaning things up that we can actually reverse the trajectory of that stuff i would say probably both i tell people it's never too early to start mm -hmm. and it's never too late to gain benefit 
Mm-hmm. So as they say in golf, you play it where it lays. <laughs> yeah. That's sometimes straight, you're on the freeway, uh, the fairway, <laughs> and sometimes you're in the woods. But that's where you are at that point. So if we could get people to start living really healthy lifestyles and avoiding head injuries and you know being able to avoid drugs and alcohol and especially tobacco, if we could get them exercising, working out, being their best selves early on in their lives, we would have an even better chance. But most of the folks I see, you know, most people don't really pay attention to things that could happen in the future. Right. Until it's getting close. For sure. It's, it's, it's a like, bias. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Now you have an emergency, right? You start to feel your memory slipping. Then you're like, oh no, I need to go take a brain supplement, right? <laughs> right. So a lot of the folks I see first come in in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond. I, my oldest patient was 96. I saw her a week after her wedding. <laughs> Let's, I, I mean, that, that's a conversation in its own right. I feel like there's a lot that that lady could teach almost all of us. Well, the thing was, her doctor referred her in because he wanted to make sure she, she was wealthy. And she had married a guy who was 20 years her junior. So he's in his mid-70s. And she, she wanted to come in. He wanted her to come so that they could get an evaluation and make sure she was using all of her brain for this. And she had led a very healthy lifestyle. And she said to me, I know it sounds silly. I'm here. I got married. But the reason is I don't have anybody to leave my money to. This person has been my friend for years. I want him, because he has family, to have the benefit of this. And I tested her. And she was clean as a whistle. (laughs) We would have a hard time keeping up with this lady (laughs) in a mental status exam. (laughs) That's awesome. But but, but it's it's possible. Those people are not the majority. Let's be straight about that. Mm -hmm. But it is possible to do that. And that's a perfect segue to my next question is I know we talked about one of two cases is preventable, but how common is it? And are we on what my sense is, is a, an increasing trajectory we're seeing more of it? Um, but like, how, what's the what's the prevalence of dementia? Um, and is it increasing in terms of rates that we're seeing? Yes, it's increasing. And that's because people are living longer. So we're okay. sampling from older populations where it's more likely. If you look just at Alzheimer's disease, that's one thing. But then when you add in other forms of dementia, like vascular dementias Mm -hmm. caused by circulation problems, hypertension, dysregulated sugars, as you were talking Mm -hmm. about, if you add in the dementias that are due to Parkinson's disease, Mm -hmm. so about a quarter to a third of the people with Parkinson's, horrible movement disorders disease, you add in also about 25 to 30 percent of those people who lose mental abilities as they age. Uh, the same thing with people who have had multiple head trauma, the people who drink too much throughout their lives. So all of those people you're talking about in your mid 60s having about a 10 percent risk. Mm-hmm. By the time you get to your mid 70s, that doubles. You're now mm-hmm. at about 20 percent. Okay. And if you make it to your mid 80s, your rate is about 40 percent tends to sort of plateau at that point because sicker people are now really dying off. So the healthier people are surviving into their 90s and up into the hundreds. So you don't see that increase, but it doesn't go down. It stays at about 40 percent. Yeah. And statistics are interesting in that way, because you could think that like one, when you're in 80, then if you're still alive at 80, you have a 40% chance of having this, but it's a population level. So you may be the healthy person that's sharp at 96. that just kind of lumped in, but you know, I, can you tease, can you talk into that a little bit? We, 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 we're only talking about gross statistics. The individual risk depends a lot more on what you're doing. Yes. What your genes were. Mm hmm makes up about 5%, but that does multiply over time. Mm -hmm. And luck. Uh, There's no getting around it. There's certain people who have angels looking down on them and other people who seem to bump into everything along the way. Yeah. So it's. uh, I don't think we are able to get a better handle yet. Perhaps Mm -hmm. we will. We're doing a lot more to try to understand what's going on physiologically with people in their 50s and 60s. 
some of this may be misguided because we're really focused a lot on amyloid levels in the brain. I think that that's actually the wrong direction. Okay. And I think we should be looking at other aspects of uh, inflammation, yeah. uh, responses to toxins, responses yeah. to stress, other kinds of things that we're not paying enough attention to. And here's one thing that everyone, I believe, should have starting at age 50 and every five years after that is a sleep study. Because the rates of obstructive sleep apnea, the problem breathing while we're sleeping, is much greater than anyone had ever believed. Mm -hmm. The most recent data, we're talking just a couple months old, which was done at places like the Framingham Heart Study. So normal people going in to be part of a study that's followed every three to five years with a variety of tests. And there was about seven of these different centers across the country. They decided this year for the first time that every single person who was part of the new cohort was going to get a single night sleep study in their own bed. They had 6,000 people in this cohort. Half of them, 50% of the people ages 58 and above, have at least mild sleep apnea. Holy They're crap. not getting enough air down their lungs and enough oxygen to their brains. Was that corrected? Is there any controlling factors or do we have know anything about the weight of these people? Or is that, is that like, or were there lean people that also are having those yeah. issues? These are all comers. Uh. Turns out that once you get into midlife and beyond, weight is not nearly the same as of importance as it is in your 30s or 20s. If you're overweight as a young person, losing weight will oftentimes open up your airway because there's less pressure on it and you can breathe better. But when you get into your 50s and especially into your 60s, 70s and 80s, you can be thin as a rail and it's the muscles in your throat while you <laughs> sleep, the airway opening wow. muscles that are the culprits. Wow. Plus you can get born with a small airway. You can, these days, uh, when I was a kid, everybody had tonsils taken out when they were about five. These days, very unlikely that your tonsils were taken out. Tonsils can crowd your airway. You can also inherit the structure of your throat from your family. So if you have parents who snore loudly, who fall asleep watching TV, who get up in the middle of the night a couple times to pee, who are uh, confused at times in the morning before they have a couple cups of coffee, all those kinds of factors, you can inherit them because of the structure. So you may be at risk for sleep apnea, which is why screening is an inexpensive way of identifying those people. Yeah. Because sleep apnea not only increases your risk for uh, dementia, but also for hypertension, for heart attacks, right. for stroke, for erectile dysfunction. For sure. Which is going to work on other mechanisms that's going to impact the brain. I mean, it's all connected. It makes so much sense. Um, and also, like, just no oxygen. You imagine the brain is so energetically intensive. Mitochondria can't work as well. And I'm sure there's a cascading of effects that happen from that. Does that seem fair to say? It does. You don't make adenosine triphosphate, ATP, the energy molecule. And when you're sleeping at night, there's a system which we've now only discovered over the past couple of years, I'm sure you know about, yeah. called the lymphatic system. For sure. Its job is to flush out the daily toxins caused by thinking while we're awake. Yeah. That doesn't work when there's not enough oxygen. For sure. And so what we find is those people end up with, uh, you know, problems thinking that's reversible, that's improvable by treating the sleep apnea. That's, that's powerful advice. I mean, everyone can start getting screened for that. And if you know you're not a great sleeper already, then it's certainly affecting your brain health in some way. And I have to wonder, especially if I've gotten more privy to a lot of understanding the physiology behind light and, and artificial light and how it affects melatonin signaling. And, and now I've come to appreciate how foundational melatonin is for interfacing with that glymphatic system, but also just for like brain health in general as a anti-inflammatory antioxidant. Like what's your take on that? Is, is that a, is that a modern factor? That's a part of this equation. I don't think anyone planned for us to be looking at YouTube videos in bed. <laughs> right. I don't think it's very good for us. Both the, it takes away from the basic purpose of 
going to bed. I always tell people there's two reasons to go to bed. One is to sleep and the other is to have sex. You can have sex elsewhere. (laughs) It's sleep that's really important. And we have a huge problem with insomnia these days. And people develop very bad sleep habits. One of them is because they do lots of stuff in their bed. They take, you know, they sort of set up shop at about nine o'clock in their bed because they're tired from not sleeping the previous nights. They've got their, they're making phone calls, they're watching videos, they're using light emitting devices, all of which are impacting the pineal gland in their brain, which is saying, wake up. And they're saying, no, no, I'm supposed to be going to bed. Right. For sure. And I know in physiology, it's like the, it's the restoration cycles of non-activity where all the healing happens. It's, it's the evening time, it's parasympathetic. And if we're giving active light signals to like, as a powerful signal into the brain, that's trying to be active blue light when you're trying to go to sleep. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to start connecting some dots that that might not be great. Um, I want to talk about risk factors and like, so maybe we can talk about it from two lenses. One, like, what would you do if you wanted to age your brain and pretty much make sure you did everything you could to get dementia or what to avoid in whatever fun way that you want to do it. But like imagine things like smoking will come up or like maybe a high sugar diet, but I'm curious, like what are the risk factors preventable for sure, but maybe not preventable too. Cause we're realistic. There's, there's factors like, like genes, for example. So let's get into those. Okay. Well, the first question you asked was, you know, uh, reminded me of a patient I saw who I told him was the poster child for dementia and he comes in and first of all, he's way overweight. So we know from that, that he's also very likely, as he was, to have high blood pressure. He's also very likely to have blood sugar difficulties, Mm -hmm. which are not only impacting the vascular system, but also the nerves around the vascular, the blood vessels. And he wasn't taking good care of it. So medication adherence, regularity of taking your medication is important. He ate lots of terrible things which put more weight on him and they were all processed foods which we know by itself probably won't tip the scales but in this case certainly added to it Mm -hmm. he was a smoker he smoked a pack of cigarettes a day complained he couldn't afford to go to a gym now in massachusetts where i live uh cigarettes are 10 plus dollars a pack so we did the math real quick and realized he could be going to the gym if he didn't smoke as much as he did every day he drank excessively we know that alcohol at higher levels which is more than two standard drinks a day for men is toxic to your brain he had no exercise except for playing pool So you can understand how little that was, walk around the pool table. So he was vertical at least, but that was only when he was out of the house. Most of his time at home, he was horizontal. Mm -hmm. He had very little stimulation other than television while he was home. And he also had terrible sleep apnea, which he was not treating. So I kept adding those factors up with him and saying, uh, you know, we, we have to make some decisions. You have to make some decisions here. I'd really like to help you, but we're not going to do it unless you're willing to make some changes in how you live your life. And I realized you've made it to 55, somewhat successful. I mean, he was no longer working. He was disabled. He had not had a good education. We know that education is protective against dementia. So if you're out there and you've got kids who are saying, you know, I know everything I need to know in the ninth grade, say to them, "Uh -uh. (laughs) uh-uh, you need to finish high school at least and hopefully then get some additional education because you're going to pay off not just financially, but in your health later on. Yeah. So we, we had to go through this. He saw me for another visit, at which point he had started to make some changes. He decided that it was too difficult. I wouldn't put him in my success column. Yeah. But I mean, it's a very powerful and illustrative story. And especially because all those things, they stack together. I'm sure that dementia or low affect, I'm sorry, depression and having mood disorders or low affect is probably correlated with dementia. Is that true? Oh, yeah. He was also depressed. I'm sorry. I forgot. No, yeah. I forgot that but fact. I mean, it, yeah. it's the whole totality of that. How could yeah. you not if that was the whole existence? That really does not sound very joyful. He had very little quality of life and he was irritable and unhappy and he just saw very little future. 
So we had a lot of areas to try to work on, trying to structure them in some way that we could approach. Because I figured that there is a lot of vicious cycling that goes yes. on where you feel depressed, so you don't exercise, so you get heavier, so your blood sugar, there's all these things that add on to each other, which makes you more depressed. So if you can't change everything, so the question becomes strategic. Where can you intervene and start to unravel things or turn them in the positive direction? Maybe it's you start getting someone walking. I, I try to get people walking 10 minutes, three times a day. Yep, that's great. And it's amazing it, how simple that is, but it works on so many levels. It, absolutely. And, and they look at me and I, I, I'd sell it to them like it's just 10 minutes and it's only three times a day. Tell me what I tell them they have to examine their butt. <laughs> and they look at me and their eyes get wide. They say, ah. And I said, no, no, not the butt you're sitting on. The butt that's in the statement, I would exercise butt. Yeah. Because whatever comes after that is where we attack. Mm -hmm. Because that's where they're saying, but I don't have the money to join a gym. Great. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes of walking, you don't need a gym. But I don't have the equipment. Great. You only need shoes. You've got shoes. But I don't like it. Fine. It's only 10 minutes. You can put up with it for 10 minutes. Or you can go with your phone, put on some headphones, make it entertaining. Listen to some music. Listen to a podcast. Do something with that time. Call someone. So we start working on their butt. And after a while, a woman said to me, well, geez, if I worked on that butt, it would probably help my other butt. I said, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I love that. And I, I think the people listening to this who are part of our Fit Father and Family communities are probably going to feel very affirmed by the discussion of those risk factors because they're pretty much doing every opposite dimension there, improving their sleep, eating healthy, non-processed foods, walking, high-intensity training, getting away from smoking, decreasing alcohol, increasing connection and relationships. So this healthy lifestyle, I think it's good for people to recognize, is doing more than just to your physical structure of your fat stores and your muscles. This is like really helping your brain. And that's, man, talk about motivating, right? That's another layer of motivation to stick to this stuff beyond just like physical appearance. I hate those people. When they come in to see me, there's nothing I can offer them except you're doing all the right stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's great. It's great news that the fundamental they're health. In, yeah. They're not coming in. That's the problem. That's the thing. Yeah. Well, I want to take a couple, couple interesting scenarios here. Um, one, alcohol. Like, so be honest with us here. You said two drinks a day, but like, what if someone was just like a moderate drinker and maybe they drink like just on a Friday and a Saturday night and they only have two drinks on each of those days. How much better off would their brain be if they had zero alcohol versus just like what we'd consider like a mild to moderate alcohol intake? Probably not noticeable difference. Okay. You know, the, uh, the people who are the teetotalers don't necessarily do better than the people who drink moderately and occasionally. Okay. And that's from a functional point of view in terms of test results. Now, if you look at MRI scans of people who don't drink at all, so you look at their brain from a picture, their brains are probably going to be a little larger and a little melt well or more well organized than the people who do drink. So it's that balance kind of thing of, you know, you certainly want to steer away from excessive drinking. You want to steer away particularly from binge drinking, where you're having four or five drinks in the evening. I don't really try to get people to stop drinking if they're having one drink a night or if they're having a couple drinks once or twice a week. Because I don't really see the evidence that will make enough of a difference that I want to spend my my capital with them on, yeah. on trying to persuade them. There's usually other things that are more worthwhile. But, it, you know, one thing that people don't talk about enough uh, is, you know, what the effect of marijuana is. Yeah, let's get into that. I was going to ask you. Let's talk about that. So marijuana these days is very potent stuff. So I'm in my 70s. I grew up in the 60s and the 70s. The marijuana that people were smoking back in those days was about 4% THC. <laughs> now it's like they have these cartridges that are like 80% THC distillate or something like that. It's hilarious. Oh, my goodness. Even, even the ones that are sort of routinely sold in dispensaries <laughs> like are anywhere from 18 to 30%. Yeah. 
And we see people in their 70s who said, you know, I enjoyed doing this when I was 20. I don't have to go to work now. Let me get let me get high. It'll help me to sleep and I'll get rid of some arthritis pain. And what we find out is that it's actually impacting their cognition. Mm -hmm. So I engage them in an experiment and I say, you know, I have to tell you, I, you know, I'm not horribly opposed to the idea of this recreationally if it's really at a minimal level, but I'd like you to try for the, just for the heck of it, not using any of this marijuana for about a month. And let's see what's happening with your complaints of word finding and the going into a room because you're not quite sure why you went there and missing things when you go to the grocery store. I've seen people come back for retesting. So I'll give them a battery of tests, find that they have mild cognitive impairment. It's not yet dementia, but it's not normal. It's in that in-between area. And the only thing they will change, because oftentimes they have fairly good health habits, is they come back six months from then, having abstained from marijuana, and their test scores are better. Was it the marijuana? Was it just luck? I don't know. But... I happen to think that their thinking is improved. We know in the short run, for six hours after you use a cannabis product, your speed of processing is impaired mm -hmm. and your ability to form new memories is reduced. So yeah. th that, that's pretty well studied. We don't know as well what the long-term effects at current doses are. I happen to think for some people, it's the difference between normal thinking and not so normal thinking. Yeah. That's powerful and, and good to bring up because it's often talked about in a positive light in some respects, like CBD, anti-inflammatory, good for joints, but like the high THC stuff and, and maybe just any of it. Like I, I've seen some, I haven't read the research like deeply, but stuff, the damage to the hippocampus. I know that the THC actually damages the inner lining of blood vessels and some of the cells that help produce nitric oxide, which can be problematic for circulation. So, yeah, I mean, it's something to talk about, let alone, okay, let alone in developing brains, you know, outside of the fact that might help uh, hurt older people. Like if, if you have a, any kid or a teen or sometime, and I think if they, if they smoke, it dysregulates their brains pretty massively and it can have longstanding effects. Have you, have you looked into any of that stuff? Yes, there's clearly a problem with anyone using cannabis below the age, ideally of 25. Right. Like that's crazy because so many people are doing it heavily throughout their teens and like it changes your brain potentially permanently. There's people using it during pregnancy, which makes absolutely no sense at all. I mean, if you want to preserve the future of your child yet to be born, you really don't want to be using any kind of substance like that during the pregnancy or around the time that you're planning to get pregnant. And that may actually be true for your partner as well, because mm -hmm. there's some evidence that THC used on a chronic basis can change some of the aspects of the DNA in the father. So it's uh, it's best not to do that. But I'm preaching. I mean, it's, it's like spitting into the wind. You know, it's going to mm -hmm. blow back. They're just people don't think through those kinds of long term consequences in most cases. Yeah, you know, you're right. If they're thinking about that, they've already stopped doing it. For sure. Um, on that note, like, so those are some concepts of harmful things. Are there any supplements that can help like fish oil, vitamin D, any other things? I have one that I take, by the way, and you may comment on this. It's a little interesting, but it's the active compound in ginkgo biloba called vipocetine. It increases blood flow to the brain. I like that one, but any supplements that can help? Not to a great extent. Okay. Uh, the original information on ginkgo being positive for your brain was uh, published in a very reputable journal some years ago. I can't remember if it was the New England Journal of Medicine or the Journal of the American Medical Association. And everyone suddenly started going out and buying ginkgo biloba supplements. Then there was follow-up research which disputed that finding. The original finding, if you look at the research, which I did, very minimal differences, but there was a large enough sample size that it was statistically meaningful. So it couldn't occur by chance more than a few times out of 100. But when they looked at it on what they call cross-validation, double-checking with a new sample, it washed out. 
Okay. Then there's also some evidence that ginkgo can get in the way of the metabolism of other medications you mm -hmm. might be taking, sort of like people who take grapefruit juice. Yeah. You know, it could be a problem for other medications. So I really don't recommend ginkgo for that purpose. Uh, the stuff that's advertised on television, by and large, uh, from jellyfish, uh, I think, and I've read their research, I think it is totally meaningless. <laughs> and I I've think never it heard of it, but really that sounds funny. A, an issue of uh, placebo effect, where, you know, yeah. if you take something that's not really an active substance, but you think it's going to help, you then say, it's really helping me. What's interesting about placebo effect is that the more expensive the placebo is, the better it works. <laughs> <laughs> Buy so, the most expensive supplements you can, and you and you, you might create some benefits. <laughs> that's right. You'll feel better, like you're really working on it. What, what, and I, you know, as far as the money spent and everything, most of these things are not harmful. What I have a problem with is that it gives people a false sense of security that they don't have to do anything else. I'm getting all of my vitamins and you know my fruits and my vegetables from these little capsules. Therefore, I really don't need to eat real fruits and vegetables. Right. I'm getting everything I need from a vitamin perspective from this little pill that's sold over. I don't really need to do anything else. I don't need to exercise. I don't need to watch anything else because this is my, you know, this is my uh, my shield, my uh, mm -hmm. protection. Yeah, and that's simply wrong. And yeah. that's what gets in the way. It's people don't say, well, what could I be spending this money on that would be more beneficial? What would I be doing differently mm -hmm. if I didn't think this was protecting me? I totally appreciate your stance. That makes a lot of sense. And now you will blow my mind, but I'm open to have my mind blown if, if you don't tell me that vitamin D3 status is correlated with good cognitive health. Like, Grab do we know? Right. And is it? Or yes. I, okay. Yes, we, we recommend that. So the range of most vitamin D assays is anywhere from normal is anywhere from 25 up to 70 nanograms per milliliter. The most optimal, so people come back with, well, it's normal. The most optimal is 50 to 60. Yeah. You can have too much vitamin D. You start getting up to about 100, you get a condition called hypervitaminosis, which can break down some of the calcium in, or create actually extra calcium that can be damaging, causes uh, hypercalcemia. So you don't want to have too much. And I always tell people, because we, we always have the vitamin D levels checked for our patients. Yeah. And when they're low and they're supplemented, I always want them to be double checked. I tell them it's like checking the oil in your car. You wouldn't think of adding oil and not then looking at the dipstick to see if it came up to the normal level. Yeah. Same thing is true with vitamin D. Yeah. Omega threes, curcuminoids, either of these beneficial? So there's been some researchers, the guy who used to be out of UCLA, uh, whose last name I believe is small, S-M-A-L-L, -L, who did a very nice study some years ago showing a particular type of curcumin, which was particularly more bioavailable. Mm -hmm. Their number was like 29 times more bioavailable than standard mm -hmm. by your turmeric in the, uh, in yeah. the grocery store. And they ran a two-year study and looked at some large groups using uh, some MRI scans as well as neuropsychological testing. It was a nicely designed study. It was what we call double-blind placebo-controlled, so neither the patients nor the doctors knew who was taking this supplement and who was taking the fake supplement. And they showed improvements in brain structure and in uh, their, their, uh, their cognitive testing. He has not replicated, nor has anybody else replicated that study, which is the oh. one thing that's pulled me back. I used to recommend it. I still do for people. They say, okay, I'm taking medications for memory. My lifestyle, as you can see, is really excellent. I'm doing everything I can. Is there anything out there that you can suggest? And I'll say, yes, you might try this here. Gary Small is it? Here's the study. You might want to get this particular brand because it may help. Mm -hmm. I can't disprove it, but of all the things I've read, this is the most likely to be of benefit.
Yeah. And it would definitely, I mean, help with just inflammation in the body generally outside that we know it's helpful for that. So that's great. And my final supplement I want to ask you about is, is lion's mane or any of these kind of functional mushrooms. Are these good? I've heard they increase is like neuronal growth potentially. Um, what are your thoughts on those? I don't really have an opinion. I haven't studied them. I've seen references to them. I have patients who take them and I've not dived into that. I, I generally try to steer away from the supplement kinds of things just because I've got other fish to fry, so to speak. Speaking of omega threes, but I'm, uh, <laughs> but I'm open to seeing because if there's something out there, especially if taking it early will make a difference and is a reasonable thing to take. I'm all for it. I just don't like things that are promising a lot and delivering a little. Makes total sense. I want to ask you about intermittent fasting um, and, and some of its impacts. Uh, I mean, this fasted physiology is really interesting. We're learning a lot about its impacts on the immune system, growth hormone levels, maybe fasting increases BDNF and grows neurons. Is there stuff like this in your book that you're discussing related to fasting and brain health? Sort of, not so specifically. I'm mostly looking at how the effects of being overweight are affecting people's cognition. How you get there is a whole other field for other people to get into. Yep. So I think that there is evidence that not just how much you eat and what you eat, but when you eat it is important. Uh, personally, I generally will, will do some intermittent fasting. I'll generally eat a low carb kind of diet because at my age and my body, the carbohydrates just, here's my rule. Mm -hmm. If I like it a lot, it does not like me at all. <laughs> Why does it work that way? <laughs> no, no. I, mean, <laughs> I keep trying to convince myself that these other things are good and I like them. And, and by, by and large, I do. I have a pretty wide palate. But the things I really want to eat, they're not good for me. And I know it. And so I, I really try to stay away from uh, the pizzas and even pasta. I love pasta and I don't eat much cereal. I, I'm sure there are things that I could do differently in terms of whole grains. And there's a lot of people who talk about this. But for me, it's a lot of exercise. It's treating my sleep apnea. It's keeping my weight under control, taking my medications for blood pressure on a consistent basis so that I regulate that because I've got family history of hypertension. And as I got older, my, my blood vessels got less pliable. Mm -hmm. My blood pressure went up. So yeah. everyone, I mean, this, part of what we're trying to do is we've got a model for dementia prevention. It's free to download on our website, braindoc.com. And I think this is really the only f comprehensive model for dementia prevention that's been put together. It includes all of these different factors and a checklist that you go through that will allow you to figure out where you are. What we're now in the final stages of working out is a way of having that online test actually produce a colorized model where your cool. individual, you know, if it's green, you're on target. Yeah. If it's yellow, you're close to target. If it's red, you're off target. And I'm really excited about this. I'm expecting that uh, sometime in February, we'll be having that out so that people can really use it as a guide where they individualize their intervention. And that's where I think the key is. It's not one size fits all. Yeah, for sure. That's that's obviously the case here. And I think by the time people are listening to this, it's very possible that if you guys go ahead over to braindoc.com, exactly as it sounds, that model might be live and you might be able to take that. And, and on that note, I have one final question. It's not going to be as much about like the research, but more about like the personal touch of this is like, how do you counsel people? who have family members or friends who have these issues who are experiencing cognitive decline, um, dementia of some form, perhaps like what would you say is like is part of the art of being with people who are experiencing this and how do we navigate this as like human to human? It's a big question. Uh, if they have a family member or friend, somebody who is already fairly well into dementia, 
I recommend that they pick up a book through Johns Hopkins Press, also happens to be our, our publisher by coincidence, called The 36-Hour Day. I think it's the best practical guide for understanding and communicating with people who have dementia. So I recommend that pretty regularly. The things that are in our book on dementia prevention also work for people with mild to moderate dementia if you pair it with currently available memory medications, medications that work to help support acetylcholine levels in the brain, medications like memantine, which work on a particular area of the brain cell called the NMDA receptor mm -hmm. that regulate some underlying chemicals like glutamate. Yep. So when we can get people on those and then work on the same dementia prevention, that will oftentimes slow down or stop the obvious progression. So I have people in my practice, many of them, who five years later are no worse cognitively than they were when they walked in, which is pretty amazing for yeah. a disease that is progressive. Mm -hmm. In terms of the emotional stuff, th there's a whole podcast on or more on that. One of the things, and, and I've unfortunately experienced dementia from both ends. Mm -hmm. uh, when my mom came down with vascular dementia about 20 years into my career. And so I got to be on the other side of the caregiving from the professional to the personal end. I concluded that it's far better being the professional than being the family member, but that should not be a surprise. It allows me to be more easily with people going through that and understand and help them to figure out strategies, depending on what their goal is, whether they're trying to keep that person at home or put them comfortably into an assisted living facility or what decisions they're making regarding driving and finances. There's, there's so many facets to that. I think the most important thing is to recognize that this is hard work and caregivers need support. Yeah. Well, I got to say, like, thank you for all of this today, for that powerful bow at the end of this. But of course, like the whole trajectory of this conversation, I enjoyed it so thoroughly. Um, Dr. Mitchell Kleonsky, thank you for coming into our communities today and speaking with us. And I think your work is amazing. I urge everyone who listened to this and is really passionate to get your book, Dementia Prevention. You can get it on any place that you have bookstores and of course, www.braindoc.com. So Thank you for coming on today and, and sharing your wisdom. My pleasure. Hey there, my friend. Thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Fit Mother Project podcast. If you love what you heard, I have a favor to ask you. Please consider taking 60 seconds right now to leave us a rating and review on our podcast. Leaving us a review is super quick. It only takes a minute and it's so, so helpful to us as it really boosts this podcast to reach more people who need this information and this message. If you're listening on Apple Podcast, you can leave us a star rating and review. If you're watching on YouTube, you can hit the like button and leave us a comment. Overall, I truly appreciate you being with us here on the podcast. On behalf of me and my entire Fit Mother Project team, we truly feel honored and grateful to support you and your family on your journey to fantastic health. I thank you for your support of this podcast and of this mission. Also, if you're interested in joining our Complete Fit Mother program and becoming an official member of our community, you can visit our website, fitmotherproject.com. And on the Fit Mother site, you'll be able to see our complete